It is my pleasure to offer you, knights and dames of the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre, a presentation on the Solemnity of the Annunciation, which, as our calendars can agree, rests neatly and poetically exactly nine months before the birth of our Lord. And yet, we might find it difficult to celebrate this joyful solemnity within the more somber season of Lent. Nevertheless, this is where we are, and perhaps in a divinely inspired way, the joyful mystery of the Annunciation and our penitential season of Lent are more closely intertwined than what is first considered. In order to highlight my argument that the Annunciation and Lent are wedded, I wish to draw to your attention a sampling of paintings from an early Italian Renaissance artist and Dominican priest, Blessed Fra Angelico. Born Guido di Pietro in 1395, Fra Angelico was officially made blessed or beatified by Pope St. John Paul II in 1982, but he was already dubbed blessed by the great art historian Giorgio Vasari in 1568. Given the name Angelico because of his masterful depiction of angels in Sacra Conversazione or Holy Conversation around the throne of Jesus, as you can see in this middle image from the altarpiece of San Marco in Florence, Fra Giovanni invites us through his works to embrace faith's truths through accompaniment and dialogue. Unlike the rather forceful and didactic yet stunning works of our late Renaissance and Baroque periods following the Council of Trent, Angelico encouraged a more profound reflection and discernment through his frescoes and paintings. With the use of four images from this patron of Catholic artists, I offer this talk on various gardens, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Gethsemane, the Garden of the Empty Tomb, and the Garden of Heaven. Incidentally, I said B Blessed Fra Angelico is the patron of Catholic artists. However, the patron of artists in general is, is Saint Luke. There's an icon attributed to him located in the Basilica of Saint Mary Major in Rome called Protectress of the Roman People. Pope Francis offered his prayers to the Protectress to Mary before this icon on the first day of his papacy, and he also visits this icon after every international visit, including his more recent visit to Cyprus. Before we address the first three gardens, let us stay with this image, our fourth garden, the Garden of Heaven. Here I would like to point out a few unique gifts that Blessed Fra Angelico brings to the table that uniquely separate the Byzantine and Gothic eras from the early and late Renaissance periods. This altarpiece located in the Museum of San Marco in Florence shows angels and saints surrounding the throne of Jesus and Mary. Here are a few pieces worth noting. The first is what is known as two-point perspective. Unlike the Byzantine or Gothic era, where art was rather flat, a new development of perspective came into play during the late 1300s, which changed the way artists would communicate their stories. The standalone icon, for example, below and in front of this painting is a reflection of the rather two-dimensional Byzantine style of art during the first 1,000 years of Christianity. Fra Angelico gives a certain sense of depth and horizon where the icon below has no horizon. Angelico's horizon includes a garden with trees and a sky behind the heavenly throne. Notice too the curtain on the left and the right pulled back to reveal the heavenly throne and the angels and saints in Sacra Conversione or Holy Conversation. Angelico's gift of perspective guides the eye to the central figure seated upon Mary, the throne of mercy. Jesus, who holds the orb, the world, in his hands, is the only one who is not conversing because he, as St. Boniface would remind us, is the singular uttered word of God. Angelico here reminds us that we converse around the only word that matters in this life and in the life to come. 
Blessed Angelico understands that this conversation of angels and saints began long ago. Take, for example, the conversation between the angel Gabriel and our Blessed Mother in Angelico's Annunciation at Cortona, located in Cortona, Italy. Take a look at this image as we reflect on Luke's gospel narrative of the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And coming to her, he said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at what was said and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of David his father, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. But Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I have no relations with a man? And the angel said to her in reply, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month for her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible for God. Mary said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Blessed Fra Angelico communicates his view of this important period of our human history. Pointing to the Father above, the angel Gabriel utters the famous, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. Blessed Angelico's genius shows Gabriel's words are painted in Latin and in inscription form. See the top line. Gabriel's next words are, the Most High will overshadow you. That's in the bottom line. And Mary's line, I am the servant of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your will, is centered in the middle. Again, the artist's creative genius shows Mary's line in reverse and upside down in order for God above to hear or read her words. Notice God in the architecture looking down. Here we find truth delivered via an angel in a straightforward and right-side-up manner. The angel offers straightforward truths of faith, but allows for an awkward and an even upside-down response to the mystery of faith. It seems to me that this is where Pope Francis has been leading us. Priests and teachers are called to profess our faith in a straightforward manner, yet on bended knee, while patiently waiting for the faithful and unfaithful who struggle and question our articles of faith and morals to respond. The beauty of this painting is that God awaits our response to divine mystery in patient suspense. Notice the Holy Spirit in suspended form above Mary's head. Love, indeed, is patient. A second profound message is hidden in the upper left-hand corner of the painting. This is the genius of our early Renaissance artist who employs that two-point perspective not only to give us a sense of special depth, but theological depth as well. Fra Angelico shows Adam and Eve being escorted from paradise or the Garden of Eden. Eden was that place where God walked with man and woman in the garden. It is where perfect communion was found, where God said it is not good for man to be alone. We were meant to be with each other. We were fashioned in God's image and likeness to be with each other, to be in communion. But through the original sin of Adam and Eve, listening to the devil's message, if you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like other gods, we fell out of that communion. But we weren't fashioned to be like other gods. We weren't fashioned to be another. We were fashioned to be in communion. But this sin put our parents into hiding. They hid from each other, covering their nakedness, and in the garden, they hid from God. 
Now here is where we have to remind ourselves of that punishment delivered by God upon Adam and Eve as recorded in the third chapter of Genesis. What was their punishment? More often than not, people will say that the punishment is the expulsion from the garden, when in fact, the punishment had already been delivered. Remember that the punishment for women would be labor pains, and punishment for man would be to work the hard soil, while the serpent would have to eat dust as he crawled upon his belly. That was their punishment. Being escorted out of the garden was not a punishment. In fact, if we recall in the garden, among the many trees, there were two unique trees. One, as I had mentioned, was the forbidden tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Original sin began where Adam and Eve ate from that tree. The other tree was the tree of life. And now that Adam and Eve had eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God had something to say about that second tree. God says, see, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now what if he also reaches out his hand to take fruit from the tree of life and eats of it and lives forever? The Lord God therefore banished him from the Garden of Eden. He expelled the man, stationing the cherubim and the fiery revolving sword east of the Garden of Eden to guard the way to the tree of life. What was God doing? He wasn't punishing humanity. He was guarding us from eating from that tree which would perpetually hold us in the state of sin, a state where we would no longer be in communion with God or with each other. However, what appears to be a punishment of expulsion from God is rather the beginning of our salvation history where the necessary sin of Adam, also known in Latin as Felix culpa, proclaimed in the exultant at the Easter Vigil, gives us a savior. Our church speaks of salvation history which begins here at the gates of the Garden of Eden. The Sunday readings of Lent often walk us through the rest of salvation history, passing through the covenant of Noah and the rainbow, then Abraham and the promise of descendants as numerous as the stars, then Moses and the Ten Commandments, through David and the prophets, and finally to this conversation between the angel Gabriel and the new Eve. In an intimate way, and through his clever use of a two-point perspective, Blessed Fra Angelico moves us quickly through salvation history, from the old Adam to the new Adam, from the old Eve, or Eva, to the new Ave. He shows that what was once irrevocable, a form of expulsion, is now revoked by the unmerited mercy of God proclaimed by an angel. I invite you to reflect on this moment when God moved us from that first morning in Eden to this recreated morning, a new day. At the appointed time and not when we were finally sinless, God saved us, as Pope Francis would remind us, in an unmerited, unconditional, and gratuitous way through his son Jesus, Jesus Christ. This comes from Pope Francis encyclical on the joy of love. Patient accompaniment is what God had offered us, not because we were sinless, nor because we apologized for our sins along the way, but in an unmerited way, God saves us. I stumbled upon this truth as I was reading from the book of Genesis. Did you know that nowhere in the 50 chapters of Genesis do we find one single person offering an apology Say, saying to God, I am sorry. In fact, I doubt we can find, apart from the psalmist, many biblical figures revealing their true sorrow for their bad behavior. There is one, however, who does express his sorrow for us all. It is Jesus, the one who was revealed to Mary by the voice of an angel, and who is found in our second garden for today's reflection. This image of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is also found in the Museum of San Marco in Florence. Here you find some interesting figures. Martha and Mary are in the foreground. Notice they are both reflecting. Martha is no longer busy about many things, but praying while her sister Mary is meditating on the scripture scene of Jesus in the garden. 
This is typical in many of the fresco scenes found in the cells of San Marco. Often, saints will be in the foreground meditating upon a scene in the life of Christ. In the middle of this scene is Peter, James, and John, fast asleep while Jesus is praying to his Father on bended knee. Here is another example of what Pope Francis is trying to convey today and what Blessed Fra Angelico communicated back in the early 1400s. When we were still dead asleep in our sin, God saved us and clearly from this scene in an unmerited, unconditional and gratuitous way accompanied only by an angel, not by any human figure, does Jesus lead us from sin to salvation. According to all four gospels, immediately after the Last Supper, Jesus took a walk to pray, although only a stone's throw away from the apostles. Ordered to stay awake and pray, they're hopeless. They are the same three who are at the transfiguration of Jesus and at the raising of Jairus' daughter. In each case, the issue of fear is revealed. In the case of Jairus' daughter, they fear she is dead. But Jesus says, fear is useless. What is needed is faith. In the case of the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John are overcome by fear when they hear God's voice from the cloud. In this case, their fear overwhelms them and puts them to sleep. Jesus too is overwhelmed by sadness and anguish, yet stays awake as he prays. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass by me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He said this prayer three times, checking on the three apostles between each prayer and finding them asleep. He commented, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Gospel of Luke adds that as Jesus prayed, his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. The truth revealed in these two paintings show that God is patient with us. From the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane, God is patient, slow to anger and relenting in punishment. He accompanies us not from a distance, but up close and personal. God does not even accompany us from a stone's throw away as revealed in this fresco. But through his grace and through the sacramental life of the church, the Lord is embedded in our lives. The Catechism says, the law of Christ dwells in the hearts of all. Not outside of us, not near us, but embedded in us does God in Christ communicate his love for us. This communication of love began in a garden then accompanied us along the way and upon the cross was made complete. It is finished, Jesus said, and he delivered over his spirit. Here I offer for your reflection a third garden. In another monk's cell at the church of San Marco in Florence, Fra Angelico shows the gardener himself accompanying Mary Magdalene. Mary assumes the one to whom she is speaking is a gardener. We read in John's Gospel, Mary Magdalene turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus, supposing him to be the gardener. G.K. Chesterton writes about this famous scene. On the third day, the friends of Christ coming at daybreak to the place found the grave empty and the stone rolled away. In varying ways, they realized the new wonder the world had died in the night. What they were looking at was the first day of a new creation with a new heaven and a new earth. And in a semblance of a gardener, God walked again in the garden, not in the cool of the evening, but in the dawn. The first person to encounter the risen Christ was Mary Magdalene. It happened in a garden. At first, Mary thought Jesus was the gardener, a logical mistake or a prophetic mistake, or a beautiful mistake, or perhaps not a mistake at all. The Bible makes explicit the connection between God the Father and gardening. Genesis 2 verse 8 tells us, He was the world's first gardener, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, and in the east there he put the man whom he had formed. 
The prophets sometimes wrote of God's gardening in a metaphorical sense. For example, in Isaiah 61, for as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations. Or the prophet Jeremiah chapter 24, in which God says of the exiles from Judah, I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. Indeed, Mary Magdalene was not wrong. Jesus is the new Adam, the new gardener, and the church is the new garden. The church is Christ's new Eden. Here, our second Adam walks in this spiritual Eden to tend and keep it. And so by a type with Mary Magdalene, we see that we are right in supposing him to be the gardener. Returning to our original painting, we see the curtains drawn and the heavenly garden, a fourth garden, revealed to those who are conformed to Christ and are no longer afraid or dead or asleep in sin. Gathered around the throne of salvation are angels and saints like Dominic and Francis and Thomas Aquinas on the right and Mark and Paul and Lawrence on the left and Cosmas and Damian in the middle. They continue to carry on the conversation that began so long ago when God communicated or embedded his very life in the life of humanity. These saints, however, are a reminder that now that we are no longer asleep or dead in sin, but rather born again in Christ, we are called to communicate with each other in word and in deed the love of Christ who is found in the hearts of all. This journey requires us to be Christian in every way, even if it requires us to die to ourselves in the manner of the martyrs Cosmas and Damian, who are seen here being welcomed into the heavenly garden. This means that we are called to embrace Christ with our very lives. Mention only be made that the icon that I referred to before at the bottom of this painting is actually not a standalone piece. Rather, it is embedded in the painting itself. This may be the first artistic example of what is called in art the trompe l'oeil, or trick of the eye. Fra Angelico embeds the icon using this technique within the larger painting to remind us that before we reach heaven, we must embrace the cross. As Jesus reminds us, we must take up our cross and accompany him. To be a Christian, to be Christ for others, means to bear his cross. Blessed Fra Angelico reminds us that through Christ, the heavenly garden, the church, is revealed to us. The curtains are drawn and like the saints who have suffered with Christ on their own journey and are now enjoying the beatific vision, we are asked to join them. But as we have been reminded in our penitential season of Lent, we must first accompany Christ in his passion to stay awake and to bear our own cross. We may have fear, but like Peter, James, and John, who after the resurrection and gift of the Holy Spirit, we move from fear to faith. It is a journey, but one, as we can clearly see, with a great reward at the end of the road. No longer living in the world of unchecked autonomy, living for self, or living as the other, we cleave together and are brought to perfect communion according to God's original plan when God formed us and planted us in his garden. Turning once again to our Annunciation scene, we are reminded of the name given to Mary by the angel. His name is Jesus, meaning God saves. Tucked within this season of Lent, we celebrate this joyful mystery of the Annunciation. The angel announced to our Blessed Mother and to us and to all in human history, the Savior of the world. On bended knee, our Lord came to save us. God saved us, not when we were sinful, but full of sin, not when we were awake, but when we were fast asleep, not when we stood by him, but when we ran from the cross. God saved, not by our own merits. God saved and saves us by the merits of his only begotten son, conceived and born of a virgin. 
I pray that this solemnity of the Assumption and this season of Lent will be a time of grace for you as you reflect on the Lord's abundant love for you and for all of our brothers and sisters in the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre.